find the celibacy towards Christ? <clears throat> so I can only give you my opinion, mm -hmm. which is not a it's shared by others. Celibacy uh, enables. There are a lot of spiritual excuses surrounding celibacy that. If you're celibate, for example, you are totally dedicated to the ministry. You have no distracting issues such as your wife and your children. Um, I was a military chaplain for many, many years, and I rubbed shoulders all the time with married Protestant chaplains. I never met one that I thought uh, was in any manner, way, shape, or form less dedicated, less unselfish. In fact, most of them were more unselfish than I could ever dream of being. So that argument falls flat, I think. Um, the, the justification uh, is generally given in spiritual terms, and it's all based on the teaching of human sexuality, that if you don't have sex, you're a better person, a higher person than those that do. Virginity is a higher calling. Um, that doesn't say much about all the people who aren't that are married, uh, but that's the official, the official teaching. Um, so you go on with that, and then uh, uh, that's, those are some of the defenses. But there's another layer that is not openly discussed, and that's the fact that the celibacy issue creates a power uh, link between the superiors and the priests, a controlling link uh, that you have there. It also um, creates a mystique about the priests, as I mentioned earlier, that, that we have some sort of extra power, something about us, because we're able to live in a celibate life. We're set apart. We're over there. Um, the, so those are those are some of the, the issues that, that come that surround it. Now, historically, uh, one of the reasons that celibacy uh, was option was was a was a um, positive issue was because when the priests, the married priests, died, their property would go to their oldest son. So money talks. And if you eliminate the possibility of an, of an oldest son, it will divert to the, to the church. Uh, there's a lot of historical uh, evidence that verifies that. Going beyond the contradiction and um, back to the integrity issue, Dr. Doyle, um, the celibacy is a vow, is it not? Uh, <clears throat> celibacy for diocesan priests is a promise uh, that there's a technical difference in canon law but essentially the end result is the same a, pre, a diocesan priest assumes mandatory celibacy when he's ordained a deacon uh, are you familiar with the broken windows concept I'm not I'm sorry I probably should be if you mentioned it but. well it, it, it's an American concept and uh, Mayor Giuliano uh, gives himself credit for it, but it's the idea that if there's a broken window in a district and you don't repair it, it allows for further broken windows and results in a general breakdown of order and so on. So he said basically to his police force, attend to the broken windows and never help attend to other things. And the point of that analogy is this, that uh, surely if by virtue of human nature, if priests are unable to contain themselves within the celibacy promise, then breaking that particular promise can induce a lack of observance of other promises. I think you're correct in that. And therefore, that lack of integrity can extend to such things as child sexual abuse or the institutional response to reports of child sexual abuse. In other words, it diminishes all vows. Uh, I would, I think you phrased that in a way I wish I could, but uh, yes, I would agree with that, that it does diminish. Um, I believe the men who are sexually abusing, abusing children that are suffering from a psychosexual disorder are under... Uh, a tremendous burden of compulsion. This much I do know from some of my training. Uh, they don't even think about vows or promises when they're compelled to act out. And many of them feel uh, a tremendous amount of grief, um, guilt and shame after they've acted out. It's much like an alcoholic who's still an alcoholic, a practicing alcoholic, doesn't want to, he wants to stop drinking. And of this I know what I'm talking about. He wants to stop desperately. But 
when the situation is there, you, you cannot, the compulsion to drink is too great, and you cannot stop. And so you do, until something radical happens and there's a complete rebuilding of you, of your person from the inside out into sobriety. With this, uh, in many instances, with the men who suffer from a serious psychosexual disorder, there's the compulsive level. Uh, I heard it described at a, a lecture I was taken to by a psychiatrist in Baltimore as, the, he's talking about pedophiles. He said the pedophile, the level of compulsion that he has to act out sexually. Now, by pedophile, I mean the prepubescent children, not adolescents. The level of compulsion is approximately 40 times more than the level of compulsion of a healthy male at the peak of his sexuality. Uh, and that somewhat explains a little bit of the, the incredible compulsion of that particular subgenre of this. The, I guess I'm going towards a, 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 another nuance, if I can, and that is that for someone who's broken the vow or the promise of celibacy, when they hear of another priest breaking the vow, that affects his attitude to his relationships with children, as sexual as the children, says to themselves, who am I to condemn that person because I've broken vows myself? Now, I don't know if that's part of the priestly mentality, but what's extraordinary about child sex abuse within the church is a lack of people coming forward to report it. And I've wondered if that's because they've taken the view that we're all sinners. We've broken this vow, you've broken that vow, well, you know. I, I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, I uh, do know of the fact that very, very few priests who have known about this happening in the, their living circumstances have reported it. Sometimes in the past, I know of instances where they have reported it. And this factor that you brought up, that I've never, that's never come across my, my screen, so to speak. Ordinarily, the reason for failure to report is I don't want to get involved or uh, I know this guy, I don't want to get him in trouble, um, or uh, something of that nature uh, where, they, where they will. I mean, I've seen cases where priests have actually walked in on other priests engaging in sex with young boys or young girls and walked out the door and said nothing. So it's more, uh, I think, uh, but the question you ask is a very good question. Why have not more men come forward? Part of that has to do with the fact that some of those who have, have been told by the bishop, keep your mouth shut, mind your own business, go back. Uh, there, in the 80s, when all of this came out, there were some priests that I knew of who preached about it from the pulpit, uh, about the fact that we need to do something about this seriously, and they were told to stand down, not to preach about it. Uh, so that's that level there that did not want that becoming publicly known for the protection of the institution. Um, those priests who have publicly stood up and stood with victims and criticized uh, or spoken out, everyone has been penalized in one way or another. Uh, every bishop who has stood up and stood with victims publicly, and there are only three that I know of, out of 4,400, uh, has been in some way or other penalized or, or isolated or sidelined, um, everyone, by the Holy See, uh, because they have gone public with an issue that the system would, would still prefer to keep unknown and buried in secrecy.